Welcome to Hot and Trocken. In this video I want to talk to you about the summation notation in mathematics. The summation notation is a tool to efficiently note long sums in formulas. So let's get started. The center of the summation notation is the Greek capital letter Sigma. Sigma simply stands for summation or sum. The summation notation is useful in situations where we have big long sums of different summons where the structure of all these summons is in some sense similar. Similar doesn't mean that all summons need to be the same, but that they have a common structure in some sense. A typical example is that we want to express the sum x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 in an efficient way. In this example all summons have the same structure, that means x followed by some index. If we generalize this index we can denote it just by some other letter, for instance i. So we see that all summons in that long sum have the same structure xi. So instead of writing x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5, it would be much more efficient to simply write down xi along with the information which values the index i is running through. And that is basically what the summation notation is all about. Immediately after the capital sigma we write the structure xi in this case. And below and above the sigma we write down from where to where the index i should run. Where the starting value of the index i is written below sigma, whereas the ending value of the index i is written above sigma. So now our summation notation is complete for this example and we can put an equal sign. Now let's summarize the basic properties of the summation notation. We always start with a capital sigma, followed by an expression for the general structure of the summons, in this case xi. This expression may, but not has to, contain a variable which is called summation index, in this case the little i. That summation index i walks through a specific range of natural numbers, where the lower and the upper bound of that range is denoted below, respectively above sigma. Now let's have a look at several more examples of this notation. Let us start with this one. So what is the difference of this example compared to the example above? Apparently it's all the same, except for the upper bound of the summation index which here is n instead of 5. That means that the upper bound is kept variable, so we don't specify it to be 5 or 7 or some other number, but we leave it open to later decisions which value it should take. That way of keeping things general is often used in general proofs, where we want to show some facts for many or all natural numbers. So how do we write out such a sum? Well, apparently we can't do it without keeping a certain amount of generality, even in the long version of the sum. That is simply done by using three dots, which means anything in between, and indicating that we are perfectly aware of how the end of that sum should look like. The end should be xn, and if we want, we can also write down the second last summoned, which would be xn minus 1. Let's say one more word about the index of summation. In these two examples we have used the letter i as the index of summation. This is a typical but not necessary choice for the index. We could as well use some other letters like j or k or whatever else. As I have already mentioned, the summation expression, in this case xi, may or may not contain the index of summation. If it contains the index of summation, it may do this in any possible way. In particular, it does not need to be an index, in the sense that it is an index for x, i, like in this example, but it can also be used as a number within the expression. To deepen our understanding, let's have a look at some more examples. First, let's compute the sum over i squared, where i is the summation index running from 1 to 5. 
That means that for each integer number value of i between 1 and 5, we have to create the expression i squared with that specific value for i, which can be simplified to this, which results in 55. Let's have a look at another example. In this case, the expression 5k minus 3 has to be summed up where k is the summation index running from 3 to 6. So in this case, we have to write down the expression 5k minus 3 for altogether 4 times where k runs through 3 to 6. Now to calculate the final result, we could evaluate each of these expressions at a time. We rather decide to proceed a little bit more trickier by first reordering the minus 3s and then factoring out the factor 5. And we finally have the final result 78. Now let's have a look at a final example which might be a little more confusing. Here we sum up the expression given by this fraction where the summation index j runs from 0 to 2. Now we have to carefully note the different places where j occurs in the summation expression. Whereas it occurs twice in the denominator as parts of the two factors, it also occurs as an exponent in the numerator. Using the summation index as an exponent to minus 1 in that way is often used when we want the sum within the summation to alternate. That means to switch between plus and minus, plus and minus. Starting with j equals 0, minus 1 to the exponent 0 simply is plus 1. And the values in the denominator get 1 and 3. For the next summand, j takes on the value 1. In this case, the numerator switches to minus 1 to the power of 1, which is minus 1, which altogether results in a minus sign. And the denominator takes on the values 2 and 4. The last value of j is 2. Minus 1 to the power of 2 is plus 1. So the next summand will have a plus sign. And the values in the denominator are 3 and 5. Simplifying, this gives which, taken to the common denominator, gives the final result 11 over 40.